So when I proposed this, um, I wasn't, it was several months ago, we do them ahead of time. So I had no idea what was like gonna happen in Israel. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about that today, but I think it's relevant to think about as we look at this aspect of our culture and literature um, to provide some context. So as I said, I'm not gonna talk about that, but it might work in the back of your minds. Um, I've been actually thinking about this topic for almost 20 years now when I first read um, Edna Ferber's The Girl Who Went Right in college. And this idea of assimilation is also something that's pretty near and dear to my heart, not just because I'm Jewish, but my dad's family is like from New Jersey and from Eastern Europe. And so this is a large sense, my grandfather's story when he came um, in 1921, I he was born in 1921. I think his family got here in 1920, right as or right before he was born, but there's not great records. So, um, and he has been no longer with us for nearly 20 years as well, but uh, I really feel uh, a sense of kinship with the people that I'm gonna talk about today. So thank you so much for coming. Before I give the thesis of this presentation, I'm gonna skip ahead. And I'm gonna talk about some history a little bit. Even though I'm not a historian, I play one on TV and I am married to one, so that kind of helps. Um, and basically, a couple things before I jump into the history. The first thing I'm gonna say is that I'm talking largely about uh, Eastern European Jews, which are Ashkenazi Jews. Some of you may have heard that, and that's what my family is from. But of course, there's also Sephardic Jews. And Sephardic Jews are from places like Spain, Northern Africa, the Middle East, um, South America, Latin America. And while they have a similar story, um, it's also different. So let's not conflate the two. Um, and as you'll see in a couple minutes when I talk about the history, Ashkenazi Jews came over in America starting, well, forever, but starting largely in the mid 19th century. And so a lot of American Jews are Ashkenazi Jews. Um, I think that's the only other term that we need. But um, I started in thinking, um, in, in thinking about this historical period, I was, had to, you have to pick a cutoff date, right? Because I can't give you the entire history of Judaism um, in like a day. Uh, so I chose 1850, not just because the book that I'm taking this key term from starts there, but also because it's a really good time for both American immigration and what's going on in Europe, right? So we know, those of you who are history students, you know that in 1850, in both America and in Europe, industrial revolution's underway, stuff is happening, right? There's waves of immigration coming into America for all kinds of reasons. And we saw some of the highest immigration numbers of American Jews in particular, or of European Jews in particular to America from pretty much 1860 to about right after the war. And why are they coming? Well, in Europe, they're coming, um, Jews are coming um, because life in Europe, even though the Industrial Revolution is there, uh, is not so fantastic for a lot of um, European Jews. So there, right now there are some living in cities, right? They're in Vienna, you know, frame, famous Jew, Freud, Vienna. Um, they're in Berlin, they're in Warsaw, they're all over Europe, um, largely. But they're in some cities, rural areas, but they're still restricted. So just like in America, as we'll see in a few minutes, um, they can't just like live everywhere and have access to all the jobs. And again, keep in mind this is 1850, 1870, right? So a lot of jobs that are available now weren't then, um, or not as widespread as they are now. So there's a lot of massacres going on, pogroms that they call, um, that raids, all that stuff. So a lot of Jews said, hey man, we're leaving. Um, and they came to America and it was okay. And I'll talk about that in a sec, but here's what's called um, the Pale of Settlement. Has anyone ever heard the phrase beyond the pale? Like that thing is so egregious, it's beyond the pale comes from this. And um, this was largely, as you can see on the map, parts of Russia and what is now Eastern Europe, like Poland, Lithuania, Ukraine, all that stuff. Um, and this was uh, largely an area 
where Jews could were restricted. They could only live there. If they wanted to live in these parts of Europe, they had to live there. And um, it wasn't spectacular. So again, they lived in what are called shtetls. That's a Yiddish word for little towns. Um, any of you can win bar trivia now on that, um, or Jeopardy. Um, and they were largely rural. It was poverty stricken, partly because it's, you know, the mountains, right? And there's not a lot of resources. There weren't too many cities, although Odessa is one of them, Minsk and all that. But they also had restricted trade. So the Russian um, czars and stuff restricted their trade so that you can only trade with each other. So they couldn't, even if they were great or made um, quilts or whatever they made and had access to stuff, they couldn't ship it out to like Vienna, right? So they were very restricted, okay? Um, they also had, even within the Pale of Settlement, places where they could and could not go. So subject to pogroms again. So a lot of them tried to immigrate to America, to other places. And we kind of know how that goes. So when we when they came to America during this time, right? They get, they finally get on a boat. They come on over. It's great, right? And this is a story of a lot of immigrants who come, especially even now, but who came during the 19th century, right? They often didn't have a ton of money if they had any. Um, there were, of course, quotas and restrictive laws that I think some of them are still in place for certain groups now coming over. They may not have had, uh, they didn't know any English for sure, um, but they may not have even had a language of commerce like German. Some of them spoke only Yiddish. Some of them might have spoken something like Russian or Lithuanian or something like that along with Yiddish. Um, one other thing to know is that within the shtetls and within this time of um, Judaism in particular, a lot of the families or the units Women didn't usually read as well. Or if they re learned to read, it was for things like recipes. They were not necessarily trained in schools. They would send the men to study Torah to do that, things called yeshivas and things like that. So even if the women were coming and they might speak two, three languages, they might not be able to write even in their own languages. So that's a big issue, right? Coming to America in general, but coming especially then. So when they came, and this is a, almost 100 years of history, so I'm really going fast, and I'm sorry. As it says up here, from 1880 to 1915, about 2.8 million Jews came over, with 94% of them coming from Eastern Europe. So that's a huge percentage, right? So again, 6% probably came from other places, France, Spain, all of those other places where they were itinerant, but most of them came from these areas in the pale, the pale of settlement. When they came, they were also subject to some of the similar concerns. They were, um, it is important to note that they were not subject to pogroms, like actual raids and death threats and all of that, but they still had restricted um, areas, jobs, things like that, okay? Um, and so it was still difficult. Many of them, as you'll see in the story, that I, the first story I'm gonna talk about in a minute, they were living in tenement houses, several families to a room, several families to a house or a building. Um, again, many of them didn't speak English or they didn't even speak, they couldn't necessarily speak to each other, right? Um, other families. So they tried to do what we all do as, as all immigrant story come, they could do whatever jobs they could get but they also had um, some religious objections, which is not working on the Sabbath, so they couldn't work Saturdays. And some of them did and wound up doing it, but they could work Sundays. So it was a different relationship and it was a big struggle. As you'll see in the 30s, there were still a lot of quotas. I um, mean, America had restrictive quotas, has always had them for various groups, for Jews in particular, um, until relatively recently, I'm not sure when they were officially lifted, but they're no longer present, but it's embarrassingly late, right? And um, so even if you look at the last two points there, from 1934 to 1943, and we know what's happening there, right? World War I, World War II is happening. Only 21,000 refugees from Europe. And I think the estimate I read 
um, right around the time that World War one, between the periods of World War One and World War Two, I think there were probably 12 million Jews. I could be wrong. I'd see the 12 or 18 million Jews already there. And we know that at least half of them were killed. So they took, America took 21,000. And then after 1945, okay, America did take more and we got um, displacement and we also got the Israel conflict that we've been talking about. Um, and all of those things are happening. So that's a quick gloss, and I'm sure I left something out. But I wanted to sketch this portrait for you to provide a background so that we could see what's happening in the literature, right? Because these are themes that are going to come up again, right? Like, as your professor says, this will be on the exam. There's no exam. But this is going to be circling in the back of your mind um, as we go. All right, so here's the, the slide I skipped over before. And basically, when I started to think about this idea of assimilation, when they got here, whether they came in 1850 or 1950, when Jews in America got here, obviously, it's not a monolithic experience. But a historian I love and read about 20 years ago, Paula Hyman, introduced this concept. And she studied about 100 years of history, too. Um, and this book came out in 1976, so it's really old. But um, I think the concept is still relevant today. And she said that when she looked at American Jewish immigration and assimilation, she noticed a couple of trends, right? And the first thing she noticed was that it was a paradox, right? That there were two things happening at once. She traces it across gender, but I'm using it as a lens um, to look through American literature. And so when I did that, the gender wasn't as apparent. It was actually about your degree to Judaism, the level of assimilation, and how much you could assimilate. And so I'm going to talk about that in a second. But that's what literature scholars do. We take stuff from other people and we apply it. So I'm not a historian, right? But I'm using this, this way of thinking about it. And hopefully the historians in the room will not be upset. So basically, what I came up with when I looked at this is this, these two sentences. The more assimilated to Gentile, and that's what the, the sort of Christian middle class viewpoint, right? To bourgeois norms, Jews were, the more access they had to them. So in other words, if you assimilated by never mentioning Yiddish or speaking Yiddish or doing any of those Jewish things, yeah you had a ton of access to middle-class culture, okay? And you could, nobody would ever know you were Jewish, right? Unless you mentioned it. However, in the literature, and this was what we saw in the literature too, in the literature, when we applied it, when I applied it to this text I'm looking at, it was that assimilation was either incomplete or came at a big cost. And so I think it's important to understand that Jewish writers, yes, they are writing for the American people, right? Jewish authors, especially some of them who did not ide explicitly identify with their Judaism. They're also writing for other Jews who can pick up on certain things about this and will kind of know the messages that they're sending, okay? So that's the argument I'm making here. But let's test it out. Okay. So Edna Ferber, this is, might be my favorite short story of all time because it's so ridiculous and perfect. Um, Edna Ferber, who is a German Jewish um, child of immigrants, she's actually from the Midwest. She was born in Appleton, Wisconsin. So she totally would have been a cheese head, totally. They lived in Nebraska. They lived everywhere um, around the United States, a little bit in New York. She writes a story in 1913, okay? So it's right before World War I, okay? But think of what's happening. 1913, um, and it's the Saturday Evening Post. And this is the actual image from the magazine. So I did some digging. Helps when you're married to an archivist who can find stuff for you on the internet like everybody else. Um, 1913, she writes the story called The Girl Who Went Right. Now keep that title in mind as I talk about it. So this story involves a young girl. She's probably around 19 or 20, but I'm not really sure who is Jewish, is living somewhere in New York, and a big department store is opening. And again, 1913, this was a big deal. We've got 
industrial revolution. These department stores are really popping up everywhere. And she wants to get a better job, right? So she goes to interview and she has to meet, you know, it's kind of like one of those interviews where you can't, you know, job fairs, right? There's a ton of people in there. And um, she goes to meet the superintendent. And this is the description that uh, we get. Rachel Waletsky had the coloring and physique of a dairymaid. It was the sort of coloring that you associate in your mind with lush green fields and Jersey cows and village maids in Watteau frocks, balancing brimming pails aloft in the protecting curve of one rounded upraised arm with perhaps a maypole dance or so in the background. Rachel was as much out of place among the preceding 178 bloodless, hollow chested, stoop shouldered applicants as a sunflower would be in a patch of dank white fungi. Now, yes, that's beautiful flowery writing, right? But what we know in literature is when a, a writer marks a character or indicates to us somehow that this character, whether the protagonist or not, is different, we know something's going to go down, right? We know somehow that's going to play a role. So she's already marking, Edna Ferber, this is like the paragraph like three or something in the story. And she's already marking Rachel for us in this way. We know she feels out of place, both in her description. So if you're a good reader of literature, you're gonna go, oh, this is gonna be a thing. A, no, a side note here, her name in this story is Rachel Waletsky, right? It's got a clearly Jew, Jewish name. She ends up, with um, the supervisor changing her name on the form to Ray Willits, which sounds way more American, right? And you can already see the wheels turning. Many people of all um, races and classes and immigrants who have immigrated here sometimes did get their names changed to sound more American for all kinds of reasons or end up going by that. So that's not new. But we already know in 1913, Ferber's doing this work right in like early in the story. It's paragraph. And this is her persuading her supervisor to give her a chance. And she wants to work in the lingerie department, the delicate lace, right? So that's, keep in mind, these are these big, you know, like Marshall Fields in Chicago, these huge stores that used to have multiple levels. What chance has a girl got over there on the west side? I'm different. I don't know why, but I am. Look at my face. Where should I get red cheeks from? From not having enough to eat half the time and sleeping three in a bed? That tells us what's going on about her circumstances, right? So she knows she's different. She feels different. Now, this will be relevant in another minute, but this is Ferber also marking it for us so that we can see it. But Jews have their ears up, right? Because we know, oh, she feels different. She knows that in the society that she's in, people are going to think she's too Jewish. So she's asked, she's hired, spoiler alert, right? She's hired, she's asked to work. Uh, with the lingerie, and she's actually pretty good at it. And she meets a bunch of people. And what she discovers about uh, the women that she's working with is that a lot of them did succeed on this floor, but what they had to do was give up a lot of their culture, their family, right? So in order to succeed, and some of them are Jews here and some of them aren't, so I don't want to make a generalization, but a lot of them ended up having access to this, her supervisor in particular, you know, she comes in, she's all glamorous, right? Everything on her. And Ray or slash Rachel is absolutely enamored with her, right? She dresses well, everything's perfect. She's worked here. But she finds out somewhere in the course of the story that a lot of the ones who succeed don't talk to their parents. And again, it's not like they can FaceTime, right? It's 1913. They don't talk to their parents. They may not know where they are. They may be in Europe. They may be elsewhere. And they've had to give up a lot in order to get this. So she's asked on the grand opening to buy a particular red, uh, black dress that she can't necessarily afford, right? Because she's probably giving all that money to her family. So here's what happens. Ray's little smile grew a trifle more uncertain. I, I had the money last week. I was going to. The baby took sick. The heat, I guess, coming so sudden. We had the doctor and medicine. I say, your own folks come before black one-piece dresses. So this is the conflict that she's facing, right? She gets sent down because she can't buy the dress. She literally gets sent down levels. I mean, talk about like, really, some symbolism is great in this story. 
she was at on the top floor these delicate silk, you know, um, camisoles and things to the kitchen utensils. Practical, like down from, you know, ni ninth floor or something to the fifth floor. So literally down, a, down several levels. And here's what happens. Despite her despair, right, she says, well, anyway, in this section, you don't have to tell a woman how graceful and charming she's going to look while she's working the washing machine. She was a born saleswoman. In spite of herself, she became interested in the buying problems of the practical and plain-visaged housewives who patronized this section. By 3 o'clock, she was looking thoughtful, thoughtful and contented. So she kind of finds her place, literally and figuratively, right, doing this. And so by the end of the story, she gets sent back up after her one-month trial is over. That's kind of the agreement that they made. And the supervisor who um, thinks of her as Ray and who says, yeah, I'm going to put you back up in lingerie. Here's what she says. I've changed my mind. I don't want to stay in the lingerie. I'd like to be transferred to the kitchen utensils and household goods. Transferred? Well, I'll see what I can do. What was the name now? I forget. A queer look stole into Ray Willis's face, a look of determination and shrewdness. Name, she said, my name is Rachel Wileski. So she claims her name, right? But what happens? So yes, you know, and I give this story to my students all the time, and I like it. I don't know if they like it, but I have fun. Um, and a lot of, when we talk about it, they go, yeah, you know, she, you can't, you have to be true to your family, true to yourself. And that's a great reading, okay? That's a great reading. And I, we talk about that. But when I looked at it through this Paul Hyman's Paradoxes of Assimilation, right, this sort of spectrum of Judaism or Jew Jewishness, I guess we're calling it, I see a different reading. And I see it a little bit more complicated, especially since she's literally into her place, right? And what I think Ferber's doing is I think she's critiquing a couple things. I think she's critiquing the ability for Jews to actually transcend into the upper class in 1913, okay? So she's trying to say like, yeah, you can think so, but here's where you get. You tried it up there and you had to give up too much. So you're back literally down levels in the department store, right? And, in, and there she does realize her true self. She gets to be herself. She doesn't have to give up stuff. But in doing so, then she does lose some access to the things that maybe she wants. So she goes right in what way? Right, so it's both literal and ironic. And I didn't see that until I started looking at the history and started looking at this lens. And it becomes a class issue. And we're gonna see that in the next two um, things I'm talking about. So we're now from 1913 in New York to 1959 in New Jersey. And this is actually um, a picture from 1959, um, Short Hills, New Jersey, which is the suburb of Newark. And now it's after the war, right? We're 15 years after the war. And the only thing I'm going to say about this uh, before I jump into the plot of this novella is that there were lots of Jews, despite the, the quotas and the restrictions and all of that, who did. And my grandparents are, were one of them, actually, um, who did, through various ways, accumulate some kind of generational wealth. I don't mean wealthy in the sense, but they did get access to the middle class, either through, like my grandfather did, going to night school and working and through the GI Bill, or through um, successful businesses that they were opening. And what started to happen after the baby boom and the war and all of this is that the cities exploded, right? And we had a great economy for a lot of families, Jews included. And Newark, New Jersey, and I don't have a map of Newark, I'm sorry, um, was where a lot of blacks, but also a lot of Jews lived up until probably the 60s. And right around this time, you got white flight. Um, and Jews are white, right? So we can, um, with all the privileges that come with that generally, um, they were starting, now that they had some um, degree of mobility, they could move to the suburbs. And so this is the suburb of Short Hills from 1959 when Philip Roth is writing his first novella. Um, and this novella just basically follows the story of Neil Klugman, who's about 23, I think, um, and Brenda Potemkin, who is 20, 21, and she's from Short Hills, and he's from Newark. And he did go to school, and um, he has a job at a library. 
And he meets her at the, this country club one day. Um, and it's not as cushy as we think it is that Jews ha had to have their own country clubs because until the 1980s, Jews could not be members of regular country clubs, right? So you have to um, keep that in mind. But he's, he meets her at the pool. And they arranged to go out on a date. And here, I'm not going to read all this in time, but I'll read some of this. He goes, he drives in his car to pick her up. And here's how he describes looking, um, driving from Newark, New Jersey, the city, to the suburbs. Once I'd driven out of Newark, past Irvington, and the packed-in tangle of railroad crossings, switchmen shacks, lumber yards, dairy queens, and used car lots, the night grew cooler. It was, in fact, as though the 180 feet that the suburbs rose in altitude above Newark brought one closer to heaven. For the sun itself became bigger, lower, and rounder. And soon I was driving past long lawns which seemed to be twirling water on themselves and past houses where no one sat on stoops, where lights were on but no windows open for those inside refusing to share the very texture of life with those of us outside regulated with the dial, the amounts of moisture that were allowed access to their skin. So again, like I'm, that's a really long passage and in the interest of time, I'm not gonna read it, but that sounds great, right? Like he's literally moving, I don't know, 10 miles, five miles. Like it's not, he's not going from here to Minneapolis. He's driving, you know, outside of the suburb and he already is seeing like, it's a different world. It elevates you, Rose, closer to heaven. Right? Whether this, and you know how this is going to play out, right? You just listened to the other thing that I said about this, but you know that, like, you, nothing happens as it's going to be. But first of all, if this is your first book, I want to talk to you. If you can write like this before in your first book, this is gorgeous writing. But think of how rich it is and how, you know, the us versus them is already there. Those of us outside refusing to share. So this is not, it's a pleasant and beautiful passage, but we already know from this passage exactly what's going to go down. So what ends up happening, right, is that he meets Brenda. They have a little summer. I don't want to call it an affair, but yeah. Um, and they st he stays with her in Short Hills. And because they really are not of the same class, right, even though um, Neil is by far po from poor, right, he's comfortable, probably like most of us here, he doesn't have these luxuries that Brenda and her family do. The parents, the father works for um, a, sink, a successful sink company and is very wealthy. So they're all Jews, right? So he, it's, that's not the issue here. It's that he's now attained so much wealth and success from his business that he can afford all of the things that many Jews and many of us aspire, still did, still do aspire to, um, the quintessential American dream, right? but he also feels really out of place. So the, a, a key detail here before, to make sense of these quotes is um, Brenda's brother's getting married. And so she goes into New York City. They're from New York. New York City isn't too much farther. Um, you can take the train, you still can. Um, and uh, goes into the city to buy dresses and Neil's by himself. He goes with her, but he's by himself. And so here's what he says, this is satire. Okay, and this is where I think Roth as a satirist is really cutting his teeth. Um, and again, as I said before, we as Jews knew, got the irony. Okay, maybe other people did too, but definitely he knew his audience was going to get the irony here. Their hair, oh, he's describing the women. He sees women shopping both in the, um, in the city and at parks where he's visiting. Their hair would always stay the color they desired. Their clothes, the right texture and shade. In their homes, they would have simple Swedish modern when that was fashionable, and if huge ugly Baroque ever came back out, ever came back, out would go the long midget leg marble coffee table, and in would come Louis Couture's, which I'm laughing because that's funny. Because um, it's such satire. He's saying, look, this is disposable. All these women can have whatever they want, um, and they're not thinking about any of these concerns, right? They can dye their hair, they can do anything that they need. He says, their fates had collapsed them into one. Only Brenda shown. Money and comfort would not erase her single, singleness. They hadn't yet, or had they? What was I loving, I wondered. And since I am not one to stick scalpels into myself, I wiggled my hand in the fence and allowed a tiny nose buck to lick my thoughts away. 
So again, he's really, this is a struggle. Like, do I love her or do I love the image of them? The image that she, this fantasy, right? And as, you know, as I said, you know where this is going. It doesn't work out. And he thinks he's won a prize. When his father, when Brenda's father at the wedding of her brother, and um, I think her name is Harriet, uh, goes and uh, happens, he says, hey, you can, if you're going to marry Brenda, you can take over the business. And he thinks to himself, oh, I've won the prize. And then he has a second thought, right? What prize do you think, schmucks? Gold dinnerware, sporting goods trees, nectarines, garbage disposals, a tank and sink, Bonwit teller? Have I, have I won? Have I gotten the prize? And he, it to, turns out not enough. It's, this is too much of a price to pay because he knows he doesn't fit in. And Roth is very careful to satirize not just the ridiculous lavishness that he thinks, but for the Jews, for the people who are in Newark, for his, and Roth grew up in Newark as well, for the people struggling, like, not just you can't have it, but you can have it, but what are you giving up? If you fully assimilate, yeah, you can have it. But it's not necessarily your place. Where you should do is stay where you are. So the cost, you either have an imperfect assimilation, right? Or you have to pay a price that maybe he wasn't willing to pay. It's way more complicated than that in the novel, but I, I couldn't have you read a 112-page novel before you got here. Um, so we couldn't talk about it. But that's kind of what we're seeing in 1959. The last, I'm going to skip like 35 years. Um, and just touch on briefly before I do that, people that we know like Tilly Olson and Grace Paley and uh, Cynthia Ozick and Yezierska and all those people who are writing also take on Roth's kind of tack. They're writing largely about women, but it's much more of a class-based uh, assimilation. So Judaism as a subject is no longer an issue um, in a lot of these novels and stories in this way, a lot of this fiction, but it is in terms of class. And Jews do have... Um, a long history with uh, organizing and working class concerns, both in Europe and in America. So it's kind of part of that. So I didn't, if you came here for Tilly Olson, there was my Tilly Olson. Um, all right. So in 1995, okay, so again, about 100 years from where we started, we get a beautiful, gorgeous novel that I suggest you all read by Rebecca Goldstein, and it's called Mazel. And this one also takes place in New Jersey. I'm sorry for all the New Jersey. I didn't plan it that way. But, you know, I am, my dad is, family is 100, on both sides is 100% New Jersey. So I kind of wrap, you know, I got to wrap here. Um, but this story traces three generations of women. One who is growing up, um, Sasha, the grandmother in the story, who is growing up in the shtetls of Eastern Europe. Okay, she leaves, she becomes an actress, she leaves, she ends up a little bit in Palestine and then in the United States since about the 40s after the war. She has a daughter, Chloe, who never gets married but has a daughter and who becomes a, a classics professor at Yale. So again, totally got it, right? She raised an independent, successful, lovely woman who has it all. All the girls in here will know. Yeah, this is a dream, right? And Chloe ends up having a daughter, Phoebe. Now, Phoebe also becomes a math professor at Princeton. Pretty spectacular, right? So we're done. We've assimilated. We've got it. Aha. What The novel opens with Sasha, the grandmother, and the mother about to uh, attend uh, what's called an off -ruff. It's a um, uh, It's at a temple. It's the week before uh, you get married you have a sh special Shabbat service, it's called that, uh, to a man called Jason Cantor, who is Orthodox Jewish. And the grandmother is having a conniption, okay? She is having a conniption. She's going, I did all this so that you could just go back to your roots? Like, what the heck? But here's, what, here's some quotes that explain what's going on. She's describing the backyard of Phoebe and Jason's house. This backyard, like the split level house to which it's attached, so indistinguishable from its neighbors that Sasha always has to count from the corner to know which one is Phoebe's, comes equipped with all the cliches of suburbia, including a redwood deck with a gas barbecue. What's that meme? I'm in this photo and I don't like it. Like this is us, right? We all have decks, you know, all this. Sasha is living. She's having what, what the Jews would say is she's, she's plotting. 
she plots um, in this because she can't believe it, right? She says, this is ridiculous. You're a math professor. You don't want to go back, backwards to the old ways. And this is what, um, again, uh, the narrator says. In fact, if you can believe this, Lipton, New Jersey seems to be the very first place in which Phoebe feels quite entirely at home. Aha. So this is a description from the narrator now. And this is clearly, remember when I talked about Rachel Waletsky in the beginning, not that long ago? She's differently marked, and not in a particular way. Like, she doesn't look different, but she feels different. She has felt out of place in this assimilated um, culture, largely. And though she's assimilated in some ways in the suburbs, she felt out of place, and she is coming back to her Orthodox Judaism, her roots, right, in order to feel at home. So that twists the paradox a little bit. And here's what the angry... I won't say she's angry, but the disgruntled grandmother says about this suburb of New Jersey. Lipton, New Jersey is Shlufchev, the name of her shtetl, a fictionalized shtetl in um, the Pale of Settlement with the designer label. So the grandmother is very upset. But what we see by 1995 in these descriptions is that to come back, we're so assimilated now. Right? So Jews are so assimilated into mainstream American culture that to go back to Judaism is definitely a step backward. And that's kind of what this art, this novel is exploring, right? We've achieved all this stuff, but again, at what cost? And in order to regain, you know, our roots, it's seen as going backwards for many, many Jews. Um, so we've not quite come full circle, but almost. Right, so on some level we have, they have, according to these novels and stories, achieved that. But once we do, what happens? We still feel out of place and we have to go back to our original roots to do that, to actually feel connected. So it's alienating in some way. So I think that's the, the, the complexity that I, I didn't see until I started looking for this sort of paradox. So basically, I really you know, think we, uh, get a richer understanding of what's happening both in the 20th century in America and in the literature um, when we look at it this way. It becomes a critique of Jews' projects of assimilation in some ways, um, suggesting that the more assimilated one becomes, the less Jewish you can be. By 1995, Judaism in the old ways are totally backward and not something we want. So if you are interested in any of this, this is a reading list. I have put Gender and Assimilation of Modern Jewish History on there, The Representation of Women. It's fantastic. If you're a historian, I suggest all of you. Um, I didn't talk about Angela Yezierska, The Bread Givers from 1925, but please just read it. It's good. Um, read all this stuff. Some of you will recognize maybe um, Michael Chabin, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. Um, Grace Paley's reader should be required reading for everybody because it's great. It's got her speeches. She was an activist. And she actually spent some time in prison and she um, just died probably, I want to say, 2017, something like that in Vermont. So close to my home state of New Hampshire. So she uh, and her, so it's got her poetry, her essays, her stories, her speeches with the ACLU and all that. It's fascinating. Um, Marjorie Morningstar, and Mary Anton. So Mary Anton is actually not fiction, but I put it on here anyway. It's a memoir, and it is spectacular. Um, it's heartbreaking. None of this is, like, positive. You know, this is not uplifting. Um, but much of history isn't. Um, but I, and if you want this slide or you want me to bring this to you in some way, I can. Um, I'm going to take this time for questions, but I also just have one uh, last thing to say. I want to add a joke. You know, how do you say bravo in Yiddish? I don't know, because I don't speak any Yiddish except to get sworn at. But uh, I thank you so much for coming to, to entertain um, my little obsession for the last scholarly and literary and personal obsession for the last couple of years. So thank you so much. I'm willing to come to, to your classes, organizations, anywhere. Just find me. Thanks. <laughs>